Glad you're here today. How's your week been? Okay, they're not here today. All right. All right. Glad you're here today. As we get ready to go to God's Word, let's pray. Father God, we ask that you take that which we're about to hear. And Lord, we want to apply it to our heart so that we are better servants for you, that we can love you more with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, God. So God, thank you so much. You call us out from the grave. All of us have found ourselves at times like a walking corpse. We're just existing, but we're not living. God, you have called our dry bones to be replaced with living tissue and sinew. You have poured your Holy Spirit in us. Let us shout to the top of our voices that Jesus is King of kings and he is Lord of lords. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Go ahead and take out your uh, sermon notes, and if you're with us today uh, visiting, welcome. And uh, we are starting a new series today called I Am the Church. I told you last week this is going to be uh, more of a series that helps those who ha are parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, babysitters, anybody who works with children or has any contact with children. Because we live in a culture today that is really anti-church, it's anti-family, it's anti-America. I mean, you just go on the anti, you can just put anti against anything, that's what they are today, all right? So our children are getting ready to go back to school. And I wanted you to be able to help your kids or grandkids or kids you babysit with how to deal and live in a culture that has really turned against us. We are now living, for me and for most of us, in a culture that for the first time has seen the, put a target on the church put a target on Christians. And I believe that much of what's being advocated in our culture today is against God's word. And so our kids and our children need to be prepared because they're going to run into this with their friends and schools. And one of the areas where our culture is attacking us is in this issue of identity, okay? You think about it, from the moment you're born, once you get to be old enough, uh, you, you, you probably could go back, and if I had you to share, you could probably tell me when you were three or four Kids immediately start playing with identity. They have these superheroes or comic book heroes. They dress up. They pretend. Uh, believe it or not, uh, when I was about five, I hung a rope in my backyard, and I p pretended I was Tarzan. I would swing from tree to tree. It was good till I ran into the tree, you know, right, you know? And, and kids, we, we have this identity. And then I went on, Superman was my hero, you know? And I thought I could fly off the roof, and I found out you can't do that, you know? And so we, we always, and it's fun, and it's we do this, and as you get older, as you go through time, as you go into middle school and the high school, and then you go off to college if you do, you're struggling, why am I here? What am I supposed to do with my life? It's a big question that all of us battle with. What on earth and what on earth am I here for? That's a question all of us have to face, and it affects everything about you, your health, your relationships, your stress level, your success level. Again, identity determines everything about us. And if your connection to God is profoundly influenced by how you see your own self, you may take a wrong path. And what I want to do today and next week in this issue on identity is help you learn how to choose the path that God has caused you to choose. Because the search for identity, as I said, starts when we are at a very young age, okay? And as I said, our kids are going to be going off to school, and Audrey's in year-round school. Their kids have already come back. And so... I want your kids and grandkids prepared. And if you babysit, if you have any custodial care of your children, you need to know what to do because they're going to ask you questions. You need to know the answers to them, okay? Because everyone who is responsible for children are going to be having to deal with this question. And the other question we have to deal with is this. What do we believe and why do we believe this? I don't know if you know this. It, your identity can be stolen. According to the United States Department of Justice and the FBI and the IRS, in 2019, 14.5 million Americans had their identity stolen. In 2020 and now in 2021, one in 20 Americans will have their identity stolen. You look around in this room, one in 20 of you, your identity will be stolen this year. Identity is a big issue. They can steal your identity and take out a loan in your name. They can steal your identity and deed your house over to themselves. So identity is important in our culture. 
And on top of that, Satan is trying to also confuse our kids with this issue of identity. And he works overtime to do it. On your notes, you'll see that I've given you just four. These, I just picked these four. I could give them a whole bunch more. But these are the four top tools I think that Satan uses to try to confuse us and our children about identity. The first is the devil uses the opinions of other people. And the opinions of parents, grandparents, friends, peers, co-workers, neighbors, okay? Professional people to conform us into an image, an identity that's outside of how God wants. A second tool he uses is hurt and pain you have experienced. And that identity is I'm the victim. We have a lot of people today in our culture claiming I'm a victim. And so they use the victim card. And that's their identity. And Satan uses that to cause you to stay stuck in that hurt and stay stuck in that pain, and you never get healed from it. A third tool he uses is the media, especially social media. You go on social media, and you look at Facebook, and you sit there and you go, why aren't we living in a house like that? Why aren't we driving a car like that? Why aren't we wearing clothes like that? Or your kids go, why aren't we living in a house like that? And so Facebook and all these other social medias get you to start comparing and contrasting your life with somebody else's life. And he uses that tool against you. In fact, one of the sermons in this series, we're going to look at digital, the digital world, how it is impacting our children today. Here's the fourth tool he uses, lies that you tell yourself. I, I tell you this all the time. You lie more to yourself than you lie to anybody else. You tell yourself things are good when they're not. You tell yourself things are bad when they're not, okay? You tell your things, uh, remember what I, we just finished this series on not being a zero but being a hero. A lot of times you'll do something and you go, I'm just dumb, I'm just stupid, I'm a failure. You talk to yourself more than you talk to anybody. Some of you are talking in your mind right now. You're sitting there thinking, well, you know, if, if what PK is saying is interesting to me, I'll listen. But if it is not, I'm going, I don't think I'm going to listen. I'll just focus on something else like how hungry I am and how I can't wait to get out of church to get to lunch. Okay? So who am I? How do I know how God made me to be? Tony Campolo taught at a little small Baptist Eastern uh, college called Eastern University, Eastern Baptist College in Philadelphia for years before he retired. He says that many students would often come in his office and they would sit down at, his, at a chair in front of his desk and they'd say, Doc, I am not coming back to school the next semester. And he says he, it always intrigued him that they would say this kind of stuff. And then he said he would pull off his glasses and look at them very nearsightedly and go, pray tell why. He said each time they would always say, Doc, I need time. Doc, I just need time. And he says, I would sit there and think, this kid's been in school for two years, and he's done nothing already, and he needs more time? You know? He says, then they would say something he'd heard always from every student. I need time to find myself. He says, we have this whole generation of kids out there trying to find themselves, and they always seem to find it in the same place, Boulder, Colorado, for some reason, you know? He says, they'll sit there and they'll go, Doc, Doc, I'm tired of playing all these roles that society says I have to play. I'm tired of playing the roles that my friends have to say. And I'm tired of playing the roles my church has to say. And I'm tired of playing the roles my parents and grandparents and my brothers and sisters say I have to play. I, I'm, I just want to peel away all of these prescribed identities that people have placed on me. I want to peel away all these prescribed socially constructed roles. I want to peel them away. He says, do, do you hear me, Doc? I've, come, I've got to come to the core, core of my being of who I really am by peeling all of this way so I can get down to who I really am. He says every time those students would say something like that, he would look, he'd say, fella, suppose you peel away each of those socially prescribed identities. After you peel away each of those socially created selves, you discover that you are an onion. And he says these kids would go, an onion? Why an onion? He goes, well, you peel away all of the skins of an onion, and what's left? Nothing. The onion is nothing more than the sum total of its skins. He says, if you peel away all these roles and identities everyone in the world has for you and take the long, serious journey to look into yourself, you'll discover, hi-ho, nobody's home. 
Why? Because there's this misconception. And the misconception is this, there is a self or an identity waiting to be found. He said, that's not true. He says, of all the thousands and millions of kids who have left college to go out and find themselves, you would think one of them would have found themselves and come back to me and say, guess what, Doc? I found myself north of Cleveland. He says, they never do. He says, why? Because there's not an identity waiting to be found. There's an identity waiting to be created. And how is identity created? Through meaning. And how is meaning created? Through a personal relationship to Jesus Christ. And we have a culture today that's trying to superimpose on our children an identity that is not from God. And so today and next week, we're going to look at this issue. Because if we don't give them the right answers, if we don't help them, they will accept some prescribed identity that our culture and our world has for them. A philosopher by the name of Blas Pascal said this, not only do we know God through Jesus Christ, but we only know ourselves through Jesus Christ. We only know life and death through Jesus Christ. Apart from Jesus Christ, we cannot know the meaning of our life, or of our death, of God, or of ourselves. Identity comes from Christ. And that's not a new idea. It's been in the Bible for thousands of years. For example, look at Colossians 1.16. It says this. Everything, absolutely everything got started in Christ and finds its purpose in him. So the only way you're going to know who you are and why you're here is have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Why? Because you didn't create yourself. So you can't tell yourself what your identity is. Now, for those of you who like a little trivia, here's some trivia. The phrase, in Christ, is used 89 times in the New Testament, and the phrase, in him, is used 79 times in the New Testament. We call ourselves Christians, but do you know how many times the, the word Christian is in the Greek New Testament to refer to us? Two times. And I put it in your notes, Acts 26, 28, and 1 Peter 4, 16. God doesn't refer to us as Christians, he refers to us more as in Christ and in him. And in fact, God's best description for us is not believers, it's not disciples, it's not followers. It's in Christ or in him. And those 89 times in Christ is used, 35 times it tells you what your identity is. Now, I'm not going to talk on all 35. I'm going to just give you four of them today. So you better be glad you came today. That might have been a Sunday to do all 35, all right? You get four, two today and two next week, all right? Look at Ephesians 1.16. It says this. It is in Christ. Circle that phrase, in Christ. It's in Christ. Paul's favorite way to describe us is not Christian, but in Christ. We find out who we are, that is identity, and what we're living for, that is purpose. Your identity of who you are and your purpose for why you are here, it can only be found through Jesus Christ. That's the only way. Now, there are going to be other people out there to try to superimpose a different identity on you, a different purpose on you. You can only get it from Christ because you didn't create yourself. Only the, the God of the universe who created you can tell you what your identity is and why you're here on this planet, what your purpose is. So what I want to do is give you four basic points, two today and two next week. I want you to think of it like a table with four legs. A table is only sturdy with all four legs. A table can't stand on one leg. It can't stand on two. You can barely make it stand on three. If you put something on that side that doesn't have the leg, it's going to top over. So you need all four legs. So you're going to get two today, two next week, all right? And we're going to look at this phrase, in Christ, because that's God's best description for us. What does it mean? In Christ, first of all, means... I am chosen, I am loved, and I am accepted. That's the first thing in Christ means. Now, all of us want to feel this way. All of us want to feel chosen and loved and accepted. You have been chosen by Christ. Look at Ephesians 1, 4 through 5. It says this, in Christ, there it is again, God chose us before the world was made so that we would be his holy people. Because of his love, God had already decided to make us his own children through Jesus Christ. That was what he wanted, and that's what pleased him. It says right there that 
God chose us. Now, I want you to notice something, okay? Look at the verse. God chose us when? Oh, you're weak. He chose us when? Yeah. Before he put the first star, before he made the sun, before he did anything else, he looked forward in eternity, and he chose you. Before he made anything else. You see, the reason is he wanted a family. He wanted children. And so he chose us ahead of time, which means he had to create an environment, a universe that was compatible for us to live in called planet Earth. That's why he created the Earth. But before he made the mountains, before he made the oceans, before he determined how continents would be, before he said, let there be light, the very first commandment, he had already chosen you. Entertainment, entertainer Garrison Kaler recalls the childhood pain of being chosen. He said, I was never good at sports. He said, always the teacher would pick captains. We'd go out on the play field. And he says, you know, when you got two captains and they're always going to know who the good guys are that athletically, and they're going to always know the ones that are not. He said he was always one of the last ones to be chosen. He said they'd get down to the last two, and they go, all right, you and you. He said it really didn't make a difference because neither one of them was that good. And he said, or if they couldn't decide, one captain would say, well, I'll take him if you take him. He says it's embarrassing. It's shaming. It's shaming. He says, because I always wanted the captain to look at me and go, I want Garrison. But he never did that. I want you to know, before God said, let there be anything, he said, I have chosen you. That should put a little joy in your heart and a little kick in your step. If it doesn't, you are not in him. Am I preaching to a dead group today? Y'all are going, I, I don't know what he's saying here. He chose you before he created anything, amen? And that was you. He looked ahead. He looked into the future, and he saw every one of you, and he says, you are going to be mine. He chose us. Look at 1 Peter 2.9. You've been chosen by God. So before he created anything in the universe, he had already decided to choose us. And that should make you feel better, not bitter. Because life will make you bitter. God says, I want this person to exist, and I'm going to choose them, and I'm going to use them to build my kingdom. Now think about that. That requires enormous planning on God's part. Enormous planning. If he's going to choose us before he creates anything. He settled by focusing his love on you and me. There's never a moment in your life that God's not focused on you. He's always focusing on you. Now, there are times you and I don't focus on him. But 24-7, every second of the day, he's focused on every single person who's alive. Why? Because he's God. He can do that. Second reason is he loves you. He's called you. You've been chosen. And the second reason is he loves you. God loves you unconditionally. The truth is, God, before he made anything, already decided he loved you. You know, when they say, we're going to go out for recess and we're going to play kickball or something. Again, I've seen this with teachers growing up. They pick two captains. And as always, the kid that's not athletic inclined gets chosen last. And if you're that kid, you're sitting there thinking, if they keep cho choosing each kid... The group keeps getting smaller that's already been chosen, and you realize this is getting really down to the wire here, and I'm going to be the last one chosen. Listen, before God created anything, he had already chosen you. You weren't chosen last. You were chosen first. You were chosen before God chose any bird, chose to create any planets. God says, I've already chosen you. God will never stop focusing on you. He will never stop loving you. He will love you for always. One of my favorite passages in Romans 8, look at this. Paul says this, and I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Now, I want you to help me with something here. See if you're awake. When I get to these parts about neither mm nor mm, neither mm nor mm, where that word is like death, life, angels, demons, I want you to shout that out. Okay? All right? Because we're talking about his love. 
Some of you get more excited about watching your football games. Listen to me. You should be over thrilled that there's a God who chose you before he created anything. So let's read it with enthusiasm. All right, I'm going to read from the verse. I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither, nor, neither, nor, neither, nor, nor even the, can what? Amen? All right, let's read the last part together. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Woo! See, you came to church on a great day. So I want you to circle that phrase, in Christ Jesus our Lord. There it is again. Paul's best description is not Christian, it's not believer, it's not followers, it's in Christ. We've been chosen to be in Christ. Now, there are two reasons you can't be separated from God's love. The first is God's love is unconditional. It's just unconditional. God loves you no matter what. The Bible describes God in 1 John 4, 8 is this, God is love. God doesn't have love, he is love. And because God is eternal, his love is always going to be here. God will never say, I will love you if. Or if you go out and sin, he doesn't say, well, I'm not loving you now. God says, I love you unconditionally. I love you in spite of your sin. I love you in spite of the bad choices you make. I love you in spite of your failures. I love you in spite of your mistakes. I love you. No if, ands, buts about it. Amen. He loves you. He's chosen you, and he loves you. And there is nothing you can do to make God love you any less because he loves you unconditionally. Now, at times we wonder if God loves us because we sin, we make mistakes, we fail. I mean, but we don't have a God who hugs you one day and slugs you the next day. So you never have to worry, does God love me? He loves you unconditionally. In fact, we get into trouble when we begin to doubt God's love. Here's the second reason. First is love is unconditional. Second, God's love is eternal. He can never stop loving you, even if you reject him. Look at Psalms 136, 26. David writes, give thanks to the God of heaven. His faithful love endures how long? Forever. And any time we doubt God's love, it is because we've walked away from God. We let our sin and our failures and our mistakes convince us that there's no way God could love me for what I have done. God says, listen, I, I love you unconditionally, and I will love you eternally, okay? And when we fail and when we sin, we often think God doesn't love us anymore. And when you begin to think that way, it's going to create all kinds of difficulties, depressions, doubts, discouragements in your life. He loves you unconditionally, and he loves you forever. So the first leg of our table is this in Christ. You've been chosen by God. He loves you. And there's a third aspect. You've been accepted by God. Now, most people don't understand this point about acceptance, okay? Because we allow our culture to influence us being accepted. How many of you remember when we wore bell-bottoms? All right, how many of you wore bell bottoms? See, whatever the fashion is, we go out and we buy it and we wear it. We let culture determine a lot of what we are. And there's not saying that's bad, but we just do those kinds of things, okay? Because we want to be accepted. We don't want to stand out and be the oddball, okay? But this desire to be accepted determines what we wear, the neighborhoods we live in, the kind of cars we drive. All those kinds of things. It even determines the kind of food we eat. All kinds of things like that. Because if we're saying to people, I want you to accept me. I want you to like me. Uh, I, I, I don't want to, you to defriend me. Any of you ever been defriended on Facebook? <laughs> Did you sit there and feelings get hurt? You know why? Because you want to be accepted. We all want to be accepted. 
Look at what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians. He says this, God alone made it possible for you to be what? There it is again. I'm going to keep driving this in your head. God's best description for us is in Christ. You didn't do this by yourself. God alone made it possible for you to be in Christ Jesus. He is the one who made us acceptable to God. So how does God make us acceptable? How does Jesus make us acceptable to God? And what does that mean? And how does that relate to our identity? You see, here's the dilemma. God's perfect and we're not. So how does God allow imperfect people to be in a perfect heaven? Well, he figured that out for us. He sent, he came in his own self, in the person of Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for us. He came out of the grave for us so that he could rectify the problem that we had created. Realize, God didn't create the problem. We did. He gave us a perfect world to live in. We're the ones that messed it up. So God says, all right, I'm going to give you a little grace. I'm going to give you some redemption. I'm going to rescue you. There's a lot of biblical theological terms you could use. One is justification, which means as if you've never done it, the, your slate's wiped clean. God says, I'm, I'm going to provide a way for your slate to be wiped clean. And I'm going to look at you as if you're perfect. I'm going to see you as if you're perfect. By sending my son to die on the cross, come out of the grave, and when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then guess what? You have a place in heaven. So if God accepts you, why do you need the approval of other people? See, one of the most liberating things in life will be when you finally learn to say someday, I don't need other people's approval to be happy. See, this is a lesson our children need to learn because they go to school and all their peers are pressuring them to conform to their image of their, the identity they want to put on your child or grandchild or niece or nephew, whatever it is, cousin, brother, sister, to be approved. And this is why our kids give in. We need to teach our kids they only need the approval of one, Jesus Christ. They don't need anyone else's approval. That doesn't mean we don't rely on other people's opinions. The Bible says there's wisdom in the counsel of many. Okay, But I don't know if you know this, but there are people that criticize me. There are people who can't stand me. They'll say all kinds of negative things about me. Uh, you know what? I don't spend one second of my life sweating over those people. Well, they're stewing and brewing and whatever, saying, I don't like Kelly Stanley. I'm going on with my life because I only need the approval of one. Why? I'm chosen. I'm loved and I'm accepted. You've been chosen. You're loved and you've been accepted. So live that way before your children. You must teach your children this point. If you do not want them living their, leaving their loved ones one day with a different identity than the one God has created for them. If we don't let our children understand and internalize this, that we are chosen, we're loved, and we're accepted, they will go to someone else for that. So that's the first leg of the table. Here's the second leg. What does in Christ mean? In Christ means my value, my worth are priceless and precious my value my worth are priceless and they're precious you know our culture is great at accepting you until you buck their systems and if you do this you'll be amazed how they'll turn on you I'm always amazed how liberals are all about acceptance and love until they learn we're committed Christ followers then the animosity and the loathing comes against us in Isaiah 43, 4, it says this. God says, you are what? Precious to me. The Hebrew word that's translated as precious there is yar gatar. It means highly prized, highly appraised, highly esteemed, highly valued, and treasured because it's something that's rare and unique. Now, precious is a very emotionally charged word. We don't hear people using it that much today. I mean, sometimes, I, you know, when I think of the word precious, I think of some old southern mom. Because you almost have to have a southern accent to use it. Saying, oh, honey, you're so precious to me. You know? Every single one of us needs to let our children know how precious they are to us. Whether they're 14, 44, or 64. You see why? Because when God created you, he broke the mold. 
And some of you are going, thank the Lord for that one, you know? There's only one of you. You're unique. You're rare. There will never be anyone like you. No one has your fingerprint. No one has your retina. Do you know that your retina is different than all the other billions of people? That were? Now we know this. You have your own unique rhythmia of your heart that's different from anyone else's. This is how unique you are. And as science gives us more and more information about how God created the body, we're going to find out more and more about how unique we are. There's no one like the children you have. Oh, yeah, you can make more, you can adopt more, and if you do, they're all going to be different. But our children need to know they're precious. Everyone has a longing in their heart to be loved, to be treasured, to be esteemed and wanted. How much time do you spend letting your children know this regardless of their faults, their failures, and the fatigue they bring to you, or their sins, their spite, and the sorrows they bring to you? When was the last time you looked at your children in the eyes and said to them, you are precious to me? Do your children know how precious they are to God? Because if they don't know how precious they are to you and to God, they'll find someone else to give them the false impression that they're precious. There are several ways we know that we are precious to God. Here's the first way. We are created in God's image. Every single person who's ever lived, is living, will ever live, is created in God's image. Whether they come to Christ or not, every single person is created in God's image. And we know this all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. It says this, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us, and they will reign over the fish in the sea the birds in the sky, the livestock, all wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So all of us contain the image of God in our life. We're all made in his image. We all have the semblance of God in us. And as our identity is surely in this phrase that we've been created in his image, it's also connected to the phrase that Paul loves to use, in Christ. Now think about this. I had this little epiphany this week. (laughs) Before we were in Christ, we were all made in the image of God. So what does that mean, that we're made in his image? Now, this has nothing to do with your physical appearance, because God's not flesh. He's spirit. We all get caught up in this concept of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, as if there's three beings up there. There's not three beings, just one being who's chosen to reveal himself in three primary ways, a loving father, a sacrificial son, and an empowering Holy Spirit. You have, just like me, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a pastor, I'm a brother, I'm a pilot. I have all these different roles, and depending on who I'm with is the role I take. God has chosen to reveal himself in three primary roles, a loving father, a sacrificing son, and an empowering spirit. You have three aspects to you, too. You have your flesh, your spirit, and your soul. Value has nothing to do with what you do. It has to do with who you are. So when people see you, do they see God's image in you or something else or some other image? Or is your image a mask? You're portraying something that you're not. You want other people to see. (laughs) I read about this unemployed biologist who got a new job at a zoo. They offered him to dress up in a gorilla skin and pretend to be a gorilla so that people would keep coming to the zoo. On his first day on the job, this guy puts everything into it. I mean, he goes crazy like a gorilla. The people cheer to see him. He starts putting on the show and jumping around, beating his chest, roaring. And then during one acrobatic event he was trying to do, he lost his balance and he crashed through the fence and landed in the lion's cage. He lies there stunned. The lion roars. He's terrified and he starts screaming, Help! Help! The lion races over him. He puts his paw on this guy's shoulder and says, Shut up, we'll both lose our jobs. What mask are you putting on a mask? Do people see the image of God in you? You see, to be made in God's image means several things. I'm going to just list them quickly for you. One, it means we have emotions like God does. God's an emotional God. We, we have emotions because he does. That's one of the things it means to be created in God's image. Okay? God uses words like precious, loving, forgiving. He has emotions. Second, we have the capacity, okay, 
for rational thought. We don't live by instinct like the animals do. We, we have the ability to use logic and to process things. Third, we have the ability to have a personal relationship to Jesus Christ. And that means every single person carries this spark of the divine in them, this image of God in them. Okay? So this may, must become an unshakable conviction in you and in your children because it, when you understand that you and every person has the image of God in them, that means we should all be reflecting whose image we are, God's. Anyone made in the image of God is a person regardless of how functional they are, how good they are. It doesn't matter how even bad they are. God's image is still in every single person. And this is the driving force. You see, one of the emotions that God gave us is one of the characteristics of God's best known for in Scripture, compassion. The ability to feel sorry for people who are less fortunate. This is why we have a passion as Christians to care for the vulnerable, to care for those who are on the edge, to care for those who are sick, to care for those who are too old to care for themselves, or those too young to take care of themselves. This is why we have this compassion to care for those who are incapacitated in their body or their mind or in their spirit, those who cannot even speak on their own, who can't even put a spoon to their mouth, who cannot change the clothes they're wearing, who cannot contribute to society. Part of being created in the image of God is it gives us the ability to have compassion for those who are in dire strait. Now, you won't get that from your biology class. You see, we're all stamped with the image of God, but you take your regular high school or college biology class, you're going to learn about a thing called evolution. Evolution says that nature sorts it out. Nature separates the strong from the weak and eradicates the weak. That nature, as if it has some type of intellectual capability, decides who are the strong and who are the weak. And that we are a product of an evolutionary process. And if that's the case, if we're a product of evolution, then why are we spending so much money on the weak? Why are we spending so much money on nursing homes and ICUs? Why are we spending so much money on orphanages? Why are we spending so much money on our senior adults and, and children born with horrible dearth, birth defects? If we are a product of evolution, evolution says they must die. Here's how I feel about this. If you believe in evolution, you need to walk up to that person in the nursing home and say, you need to die so the rest of us benefit from it. That's evolution. That's not God. And when you look at nature, you don't see animals doing this. I mean, if a lion comes across a young or injured gazelle, I've never seen a lion in a National Geographic special look at that gazelle and say, oh, you poor thing. Let me take you back to our pride and we'll care for you till you're healthy. No. What does that lion do? Kill it and they eat it. Now, I know some of you are animal people. Yes. To female animals, God gives a maternal instinct to care and for their young and they will nurse them. They will protect them. We have this phrase, there's nothing like a mother bear, okay? But when that cub gets to be an adult, that paternal instinct leaves. That maternal instinct leaves. And you can watch National Gra Geographic siblings that grew up together, became adults, will fight and kill each other. Their own mother will kill them for food. See, we believe that God loves all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they're all What? precious in his sight god created humans to be equal in value we're different in skills and abilities and in intellect but we're equal in value yet if you go to our culture and you study evolution evolution will influence your children we're not equal in value and one of the biggest contributors of racism has been evolution let me show you some quotes Stephen Jay Gould is an evolutionist. He says this about the connection between evolution and racism. Biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1859, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. The litany is familiar, cold, dispassionate, objective. Modern science shows us that races can be ranked on a scale of superiority. 
If this offends Christian morality or a sentimental belief in human unity, so be it. Science must be free to proclaim unpleasant truths. That's evolution. Charles Darwin, the father of evolution, wrote this in his most famous book, The Descent of Man. At some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races through the world. At the time, at the same time, the anthropomorphous apes, anthropomorphous is two Greek words, anthro uh, man morphous looks like, he's referring to the aboriginals, he called them apes, will no doubt be exterminated. The break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider, for it will be intervened between man and a more civilized state, as we may hope, even than the Caucasian, and some ape as low as a baboon, instead of now between the Negro, or the Australian, meaning the Aboriginal, and the gorilla. See what I'm saying? Charles Darwin says, when you look at Africa, they're not on the scale that we are as white people. When you look at Australia, they're Aboriginal. They're not on the scale where we are. They look like monkeys. You remember the Scopes trial? How many of you remember the Scopes trial? We all studied in history. The textbook that was used was the biology book in that trial called A Civic Biology by George Hunter. Let me read you what was read at the trial. And it's directly from the book. At this present time, there exist upon the earth five races, varieties of man, each very different from the other in instincts, social customs, and to an extent in structure. These are the Ethiopian or Negro type, originating in Africa, Malay or brown race from the islands of the Pacific, the American Indian, the Mongolian or yellow race, including the natives of China, Japan, and the Eskimos, and finally, the what? Highest types of all, the Caucasians, represented by the civilized white inhabitants of Europe and America. When your kids learn evolution, they will come to an inclusion that they are better than other people because that's what evolution teaches and that's what it believes just recently this past week Fox News interviewed an evolutionary biology teacher on their on their show about this very thing she teaches evolutionary biology at Harvard and she got into trouble with her other Harvard colleagues with the statement she made here's what she said the ideology seems to be that biology really isn't as important as how somebody feels about themselves or feels the sex they are to be. She said, scientifically, the science shows that there are only two sexes. There are male and female, and those sexes are designed by the kind of gametes we produce. She says, never in the history of science has science proven there's any other type of gender. Now, one of her other colleagues at Harvard who teaches evolutionary biology, a lady named Sirach Simone Lewis. Here's how she identifies herself. She says she's a bluish feminist mermaid. I looked her up. She's not blue, and she doesn't have any fins. She has no gills, but in her mind, She's a mermaid. Now, in the old days, if you thought you were a mermaid, what did we do with you? Hi-ho, hi-ho, is off to the loony house you go. But today, you can claim to be anything you want, and that's what you are. She said, I respect Carol as a colleague and a scientist, but this is dangerous language because it perpetuates a system of discrimination against non-cis people. And I had to look that up. Non-cis means they don't claim any gender people within the medical system. It directly opposes our task force that works to create a safe place for scholars of all gender identities and sexes. And I thought, you know, I thought about Looney Tunes. Do, 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 do. That's not all, folks. This is what your children are going to face. This is what your grandchildren are going to face. Are you preparing them on how to deal with this? That our kids need to know they are precious in God's sight and they're precious in your sight. You see, the liberals really think they're smarter and better. 
This is why parents, you must teach your children that their identity is from God and God alone. If you do not, then they may develop an attitude that people with Alzheimer's or dementia or those who have a mental illness or those who have cerebral palsy or those who have an intellectual disability. We don't call it mental retardation anymore. We call it mental um, intellectual disability or who have some physical disability or birth defect or who are comatose in a nursing home or someone who cannot read or write, that those people are inferior and are not of equal value. Or if your children have any of these symptoms, they may think they're inferior. Anyone who has any of these horrible conditions has the same value as anyone else. They're precious in God's sight because they're made in God's image. This is one of the reasons, parents, you must teach your children that their identity comes from God. This is why you must see and believe that their identity comes from God. This is one of the reasons who stand against abortion. Because the unborn bear the image of God. And we have raised generation after generation that the unborn are not even human. It's like cancer in my body, and i got to kill it. Millions and millions of babies have been eradicated and killed because of this thought of evolution. This is why it perpetuates. This is why it's in our school system. This is why it's all over our country. Because evolution teaches the strong survive, the weak are need to be killed and gotten rid of. And it's my choice to decide. Listen to me. Every person is created in God's image, and it's for God to decide, not us. No matter if the person you're looking at is doing something heinous or horrible or terrible or criminal or evil, and they deserve some form of punishment in our penal system, for the consequences of their bad behavior. Every single person, even the very worst, are still created in God's image. And this is why we should never refer to another human being in degrading ways. The talk of human beings as animals, to call them names like dogs or cockroaches, to call them fools or idiots or undesirable, to use profanity-laced names or any deplorable degrading name is to speak against the image of God in that person. It is all. Anytime we speak in degrading terms of other human beings, even at their very worst, we're being blasphemous. Our identity comes from God. And I'm going to deal with this one later in the sermon on, on digital technology. But for now, let me say this. I'm very concerned because I've been on Facebook, and I'm, I'm appalled at the names and the language people who call themselves Christians are using on Facebook about other people. Some of them are very involved in their churches. Some are on their praise team. Some are leaders in their churches. And they're using every profanity-laced term to describe somebody else. Lead, read my lips. You are sinning, and it's blasphemous because that person is created in the image of God. And when you denounce that image, you have denounced the Lord God of this universe. Watch your tongue. Watch your language. Watch the terms you use to refer to people. Our God will not be mocked. You see, the reason our kids use so much profanity today is because their parents do. They learn it at home. Emmy wasn't in Har uh, Harvard. <laughs> yeah, she ain't going to Harvard yet, but you might, baby. I don't know. But when she was at Harvard and they had the COVID and they shut down everything, from that point on for the next year and a half, she never stepped into class again. Everything was online. She did everything online. Then she graduated. She had to go back for rehearsal. And all the kids marched, and she said, you know, I forgot how much profanity kids at Harvard use. You cannot correct your children for using profanity if you use it too. That is hypocrisy, and they will see right through it. You see, part of the, what evolution teaches is that you're free to be me and choose your own destiny determine your own identity we must be careful parents here's another way we know we're precious in God first we're creating God's image second Jesus died for us he died for us God came in the person of Jesus Christ he lived a perfect and sinless life he died for our sin and rebellion on the cross God could have just said I'm done <laughs> I won't just let him die and go to hell, but he didn't. He came in the person of Jesus Christ, took our place, paid our price, paid for our penalty, 
and offered us eternal life. Peter writes this in 1 Peter 1. He says this, You were rescued from the useless way of your life that you learned from your ancestors. Notice, how you learned it from your parents. You learned it from your grandparents. But you know what? You were not rescued by such things as silver or gold that don't last forever. You were rescued by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, that spotless and innocent lamb. There it is. Circle the word precious. See, if you think the death of Jesus on the cross is precious to you, you'll watch your mouth. You'll watch your tongue. You'll watch what you say, especially around your children. Because they're precious to God, and if you're not careful, they will take on a different identity, even in their language, when they become adults. The word that Peter uses here for precious is timios. It's similar to the Hebrew Old Testament, yagatar. In addition to everything that old Hebrew word means, it also means this, priceless, costliness, meaning you don't have enough money. There's not enough money, wealth in this world to buy it. That's how precious you are to God. God says, I'm going to use something that's precious, highly valued me, the blood of my own son to pay for their sin. That's how valuable, that's how precious you are to her. So not only have we been stamped with the image of God in our life, but Jesus shed his blood life for us because we're precious. Now, there's some debilitating lies that our culture throws at us to attack our identity. Here's the first one. Everything in the universe, they'll say, is random, including us. Thus, we do not matter, and life is meaningless. I'm going to do a series, maybe in the spring, on this issue of creationism. And they always like to go to the fossils. But there's nothing in the fossil record that proves evolution. Nothing. We'll get to that next year, all right? People have been bought. They've bought the lie from evolution that life is just random. Thus, and life doesn't matter. It's meaningless. Because we've taught this for years and years rather than teaching our kids they're creating God's image. They're not a random accident. God intentionally and willfully allowed your children to come into this world. And that means every single child, every single person, their life is precious to God because they've been stamped with the image of God. And let's say you get past this first lie. You do believe that life is meaningful. You do believe that. But you've got another issue you're going to have to battle. Here's the second debilitating lie our culture will tell us. The fear that if we reveal to other people who we are, what we have done, where we have failed, and where we have sinned, and what our addictions are, and what we're ashamed of, then we can believe the lie that we will not matter to them. I plan to talk about more of that in our series as well, because your children are going to make mistakes, some big ones, just like you have. Everybody's got junk in their lives. Everybody's got skeletons in their closets. Everyone in this room does. And there are days I sit there and think, God, I wish I hadn't have thought this. God, I wish I hadn't have done this. God, I wish I, and I go through this thing, I wish I hadn't have thought these horrible thoughts or these sinful thoughts or whatever it is. God, I wish I could go back and rewind history. If I was in that scenario, do this instead of what I did. Because I'm ashamed of what I did or what I said. We've all got skeletons in our closet. And I think all of us would be terrified if God could just use these screens and go through every single life here and show every single bad thought, sinful thought, every sinful action you've ever done right there. Would you want him to do that? No! So why are you so hard on people when they blow it? You see, this is evolution. I'm better than you. And that's what your kids are learning. That's what they're going to believe. The ugly thoughts, the hateful thoughts, we all have them. The racist thoughts, the violent thoughts, the pornographic thoughts, the vindictive thoughts, they fill all of our minds. And when those things, we know other people may not necessarily know exactly what we're thinking, but it can lead us to the place where we think, oh, okay, I know God loves me and accepts me, but if anybody really found out who the real person I am, they would not have anything to do with me. But here's the comfort. God has created us in his image, and he's created people to do that. This is one of the reasons I want us to start Celebrate Recovery again. We had this ministry here. It was a very, very wonderful, viable ministry in our church of helping people start where they are, their faults, their failures, 
our mistakes, our addictions, whatever it is, and recover. You see, if you go to an AA group, you're identified by your problem. You say, Hi, I'm Kelly Stanley, and I'm an alcoholic. So my identity is I'm an alcoholic, and that's the problem I have with AA. I know it's helped a lot of people. What I love about Celebrate Recovery is you go and you say this, hey, I'm Kelly Stanley. I'm in Christ. I'm a Christian who at times has struggled with alcohol. You see, there's a difference. My identity is not my addiction. My identity is the one who is saving me from it. And we have people all around us who may not come in here for worship, but they would come to a Celebrate Recovery group and eventually get saved and become part of our church. So what I'm asking is some of you to put on your prayer cap and say, hey, I will take this and I will do it. I will train you, I will lead you, and I'll help you get it done. But if we're going to reach the lost, this is one of the best ways we're going to reach them. You know, one of my favorite verses is Romans 5.8. But God has shown us how much he loves us. It was while we were still what? See, you need that. Those of you who like tattoos, you need to tattoo that on your skin. He didn't say, all right, I'm going to wait for Dennis Chisholm to get his life straight before I save him. No, I'm going to wait for Lori Bailey over to get her life straight before I save her. No, he, he knew. He looked at you. He looked at me before he created the first star, created anything. He says, listen, I'm going to give them away. To come to me in spite of being sinners. That's how much God loves you. That's how precious you are to him. That's how much he has accepted you. And that's why you need to let the world really see the image of God that's in you. Because he's called us and saved us while we were still yet in rebellion against him. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 7, 23, you have been bought and paid for by Christ, so you belong to him. Do you know what the word providence means? Providence is an old word. It's, it refers to place of origin. So in the world of value, providence really matters. Whether it's in the world of antiques or jewelry, who had that jewelry, who owned that jewelry, how old is that jewelry, how old is that antique, whose house was that, whose car was that. Ownership matters. And value can be determined by how rare something is or who owned it. A gym dealer was strolling the aisles of a Tuscan gym and mineral show when he noticed this blue, violet stone the size and shape of a potato. He asked the vendor, how much do you want for that? He says, oh, $15. He said, can I give you 10? All I got is a 10 on me. He said, yeah, take it for 10. Now, this guy knew something that that guy didn't know. He went and had it appraised. Okay? The stone he bought for 10 bucks. That stone has since been certified as a 1,905 carat natural star sapphire, 800 carats than any sapphire that's ever been found. It was appraised at $2.28 million. You see, it took a lover of stones to recognize the sapphire's worth. And it took a lover of souls to recognize the true value of ordinary looking people like you and me. The Bible says our providence is in God. God is the source of how we came to be. You see, ownership makes all the difference in the world. It's the providence. It's who you belong to and who you belong to first. Paul's favorite way to describe that is in Christ. We've been stamped with the image of God. We belong to God, our owner. He has chosen us. He loves us. He's accepted us. He finds we're valuable, so valuable, the Greek word he uses is priceless. Not enough money in the world. And that's what gives us the ability to be the church in this world. Southside, your children need to know this. Otherwise, they'll choose a different identity. And go a different path. That's what it means to be. I am the church. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks and praise. Lord, forgive us when we use language that puts down another person and the image of you in them. 
All of us are guilty of this at times, either intentionally or unintentionally. We, we see something, somebody cuts us off on College Road, and out of our mouth comes this description of them. Or we're around our friends, and we want to be accepted, so we use terms about other people that are degrading. Lord, every single person is created in your image, and thus when we use derogatory names, profanity-laced names, we are being blasphemous against you because you created every single person in your image. God, our children, our grandchildren, our nieces, our nephews, our young little kids we call cousins, the kids we babysit, they need to understand their identity comes from you. Their purpose can only come from you. God, today lay on every heart who's here today and those who are listening to realize how precious children are. And help us, God, as a church, to help our children understand that their identity only can come from you. And knowing their purpose in life can only come from you by having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that makes them in Christ. Now, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, you've got to make a decision. What are you going to do now? You've heard God's word. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to say, well, I got my blanks filled in and walk out and go to lunch? Or are you going to really think about what you've heard today and say, all right, there's some changes I need to immediately start making. Maybe the first one is, hey, I need to get on the phone, call up my children, and just say, you are precious to me. Some of you, your children may be here today. You need just, before you even walk out here, look down, get in their eyes and say, look, take their little faces in your hands and say, I want you to know you are precious to me. And as I was preparing for this sermon, I said to Emmy yesterday, I looked at her and I said, Emmy, you're precious to me. Some of you need to change your language. Because it doesn't honor God. You can justify it all you want. But it doesn't honor God. We're created in his image. I mean, let me put it this way. Can you imagine God using profanity? No, you bear his image, so we shouldn't use it either. Can you imagine God using profanity-laced names to put someone down? No, we shouldn't either. Maybe you need to decide from now on, when I'm around children, whether they're mine or my grandchildren, or kids I'm babysitting, I'm going to help them understand that God has chosen them. He loves them and he accepts them. Now, yes, that acceptance doesn't mean he doesn't ignore our sin. The Bible says if we sin and we disobey him, he will discipline us, just like any loving parent would do with their child. But his love is eternal. His love is unconditional. And I know all of you have issues that your children have done that you almost wanted to kill them. to Jesus Christ that's where you start in Christ the only way to know your identity the only way to know your purpose is you got to be in Christ if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ you can come down here and talk to me I'd love to lead you in a process to come into Christ or if you need to recommit your life to Christ there are things you some balls you've dropped along the way there's some mistakes you made I'm not here to cast blame or cast fault I'm just saying, hey, start over. That's the one thing I love about God. He lets us start over. You can't undo the past, but you surely can make a difference in the future. You just want to come and kneel here and pray. You're free to do that. Or come and ask me to pray. You're free to do that. Steve's going to play in the background. You pray, and you respond as God works in your heart.